Hello everybody, this is Gregory with 5-Minute Catholic Apologetics, where 5 minutes of your time may get you to the divine. Today we're going to look at the parallels between the Constitution and the Bible, all seen through the prism of the Magisterium. Now before we begin, let's start with a prayer. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritui Sancti, in nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritui Sancto, Sucuturam Principio et Nuc et Semper et Seculae Seculorum. Amen. All right, so we have several episodes here on nullifying Bible alone and also talk about the three pillars of Catholic apologetics, which is sacred oral tradition, sacred scripture, and the magisterium. And we have separate episodes on all three of those components. And I thought it'd be good to use the Constitution kind of as an example. Believe me, this is not a perfect parallel, but there are a lot of parallels to it. So let's get to it. So if you look at the Founding Fathers, the Founding Fathers, there was an original core. They were inspired by a philosophy and a belief of self-determination, for example, and that our rights are given by God and not from state. And they decided to put some of these things in writing. Now, not all of their beliefs were put in writing. And certainly if you look at the period between the Continental Congress and the Constitution being written. Uh, we had the Articles of Confederation, which were, were very weak and so forth, but a lot of what they envisioned the government to be was written in the Constitution. Now, they wrote the Constitution, and God bless it's one of the best uh, written articles of, of, of all time, and so many countries have mimicked their Constitution based on ours, especially in the Western Hemisphere and in, in the colonial areas, that I don't want to nullify the Constitution, but understand that the Founding Fathers created a Constitution, but they also created a working government. And one of the aspects of that working government was some ability to interpret the Constitution because they understood that a written document, albeit created by them, a written document cannot talk. A written document cannot interpret itself. There needs to be one interpretation and from that we get the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's job is essentially to, to decide whether or not something is constitutional or consistent with the beliefs of the Constitution or whether or not something is unconstitutional. And we have nine people in this group and this group keeps changing. You know, there was a time that FDR wanted to have more than nine members. But it's always a revolving group, but it's always the same mission is to interpret the Constitution. And yes, the Constitution uh, has had things added to it that are consistent to it. We have had the original 10 uh, amendments, the Bill of Rights, but now we, or we have something like 26, 27, 28, and so they keep adding to it. But all the additions to it are still consistent with the spirit of the Constitution. And so if you compare that and parallel that to the early church, there's a lot of really good parallels because the early church, again, had beliefs. Christ founded a visible hierarchical church, and they had beliefs. And some of those things were put in the Bible. Even John mentions it at the end of the Gospel of John. These are just some of the things that happened uh, to in Christ's life, and there's not enough pages in the world that would be able to fill all of it. And so... The Bible was written out of sacred old tradition. We have an episode here, like what did the early church do before the, 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 the epistles and uh, the, the gospels were being circulated? So like, you know, the first 30, 40 years and they didn't have a Bible and they were able to function fine because they had apostolic tradition. They had the oral teaching of the apostles and the disciples and so forth. And they had sacraments and all these things. But they had, they had that. So look, the, the Bible, of course, is important. We consider that the Holy Spirit is the principal author, and it's, it's, it's something that all Catholics should read every day. But the early church had the same intention that the Founding Fathers did. A Bible can't talk. A Bible cannot interpret itself. And so you need some governing authority that determines whether or not future developments that occur and this is one of the reasons that Christ gave us the parable of the mustard seed, right? The church started out small and then it went to the entire world through the Catholic Church, of course. But it needs to have some sort of governing authority that determines when future considerations are given, whether or not these jive with apostolic tradition. And that's the magisterium of the church. 
So you need something to interpret the Bible, just like you need the Supreme Court to interpret the Constitution. The Constitution is not a living document like the liberals will tell you. It needs to be interpreted by humans who have a rubric, use a teacher term, on how they're supposed to interpret it. And it's the same thing. The, the, the church, the Catholic Church today, has a magisterium that is able to interpret the Bible, and it's protected by the Holy Spirit. There's really papal infallibility. And so it's the same principle. The Bible never tells you, for example, which book should be in the Bible. Now, where will you find in the Bible? These are the books that need to be in the Bible. Also, the, the, the Bible, New Testament, Jesus never says that, of course. Everything you need to know about being a Christian or a Christian handbook needs to be explicitly mentioned in the Bible. Nowhere does Jesus say that. So we've talked about this before. So the Bible was given to us by the early church out of sacred oil tradition, but you need a governing authority, a magisterium protected by the Holy Spirit because it makes sense. If sacred oil tradition, tradition is protected by the Holy Spirit and the Bible, of course, is protected by the Holy Spirit, then you need the governing authority to also be protected by the Holy Spirit. And so it adds on to the traditions, and you see this, we call the deposit of faith. Things have been added on through the centuries. Nothing that's inconsistent with the Bible or the teachings of the early church. Nothing at all. I mean, we, we've talked about that in that episode about did the Catholic Church take on pagan traditions? And in short, no, it didn't. And even that didn't jive with theology, they didn't appropriate, but things that didn't, that had nothing to do with theology, sure, they took over like pagan temples and, and reconsecrated them. But either way, there needs to be a governing authority that is able to interpret the Bible in one way, one official way, and, and that's the Catholic Church. And you see what happens when we don't have that governing authority. You have denominationalism, which now you have tens of thousands of different groups all saying that they have the true interpretation, even though they all a lot of them conflict with each other and they're always fighting with each other. That's not what Christ wanted. So he wanted one church and one governing authority, his church, his visible church that he founded on Peter, and we have 266 successors that will interpret it. <laughs> and the and last thing is, again, it's not a perfect analogy, but you get my point. You know, you need you need to the Constitution and the Bible both need a human living authority to properly interpret it. And you see both organizations perhaps being co-opted. You see the Supreme Court has, has had activist judges now for what, at least 60 years since the Warren Commission, Warren Court, I should say. And a lot of people are, are concerned about that and how, you know, essentially abortion got pushed through activist judges and gay marriage and all these things like that. And <clears throat> perhaps the Constitution is being abused, no doubt. Uh, in the last you know, 30 years, let's say, and some could say about the church and the church has been infiltrated and, and certainly there's there's unseemly elements that are maybe pushing it away from traditional teachings and so forth. And, and that's the thing is this happens, right? Because it, both institutions, albeit <coughs> uh, given noble means, and certainly the, the, the church example is, is protected by God, does not mean that bad people can infiltrate it. And bad people have been infiltrated since the beginning of time. Judas was a bad guy. He infiltrated the original 12. We've always had bad people, and we have episodes that talk about this. But my point is, you can have everything set up in a governing authority, but there's no guarantees that it's it's not going to be uh, corrupted or or misinterpreted and that's what you see in some levels happening in both entities but ultimately we know unlike the constitution example that the church is protected and christ says that the gates of hell will never persevere and we just have to persevere until the end but either way i know the analogy is not perfect but you know understand where i'm coming from comparing the constitution needing a, a, some sort of entity to interpret it with also the same thing with the magisterium being able and having the authority to interpret the bible Guys, post in the comments. Let me know what you agree or disagree. I know the analogy is not perfect. Again, I don't have to say it a thousand times, but I just wanted to do an episode on this. I would really love to hear from you. Please hit the notification, subscribe, and share button. Share with like-minded people. Until next time, take care. God bless and pray.